I'm so excited to kick off our first DevCon here, uh, really the culmination of a lot of work and focus on the product side over the last two years to, to make this a developer platform, which we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. But thank you guys for joining us. Awesome. Well, as Anurag mentioned, this is DevCon one of one. I guess to kick us off, why now? Why have we started DevCon at this point? And kind of what's the journey that led us, led us to today? Well, I, you know, if you if you think about Palantir, like the thing that we hold sacred is the primacy of winning. It's this idea that we should all be thinking backwards from first principles of what's actually required to manifest the outcomes in the world that that matter, and not inheriting like the architectures or the ideas of how we wish the world would work. And I, I think it's inarguable that we have this legitimacy crisis in the world. Why are doors falling off airplanes? Why do we need a doge right now? You know how like the, the institutions of our world, both public and private, have become very sclerotic. And I think it's we've we there's a huge amount of entropy in the system. How are we going to counteract that? Uh, and a, a big part of Palantir's journey has been working on that over, over time. But what I've seen over the last two, three years is that if you're really going to honor the primacy of winning, it's about extending that culture and that tool chain to the folks like you, our customers, who are developers, to go build these things. We're seeing that play out in the field. 700 uniformed service members at the 101st Airborne built the search and rescue common operating picture for Hurricane Helene within 24 hours of being activated. They, these are not even formally trained computer scientists, but they are builders. They can write code, and they did that to save lives. I, you would not have seen that a decade ago. There was no product to build to help them go do that thing. But now we're seeing that occur over and over again in so many different dimensions that like, it's very clear that the, if you want to maximize impact, if you want to go solve these problems, it's about excreting, it's like externalizing essentially the tool chain and the tradecraft and the culture that we've had over, over a period of time, making you all essentially for deployed engineers. Incredible. And I think we've seen that develop right over time where people have moved from operational users through to the people that are actually architecting these solutions. You mentioned there that the products come a long way, but that's not just a product story, right? No. There's a bit of a, there's a mindset shift. There's an entire shift in how you approach problem solving, how you think about conceiving a solution, building that solution, then deploying it. So have you seen that sort of change in our customers? Like, have you seen our customers sort of develop that mindset, that intuition over time? Yeah, I think a lot of the things that we used to believe that we kind of earned inductively in the field were so heterodox that there was no place to land them with the customer. Like the idea that, you know, having a system of insight that was analytical and having a system of operations or action that was operational um, was a bug, not a feature, was heterodox 10 years ago. No one wanted that. You know, people wanted to live very comfortably in their data science silo over here. And then there was a different kind of approach to dealing with things that, that happened on the factory floor over there. And it just screwed up the OODA loop profoundly. Now it's not heterodox to say that. If you say that this is the bug and you're trying to solve it and you're trying to like, what's, you know, data is not the new oil, it's the new snake oil. Who cares if you have an insight, if you can't do anything about it, it's purely, act like these, these are now truisms that people have absorbed. So I, I think the moment to say like, look, there's receptivity to absorbing the, the tradecraft and the approach around which we built all of the software uh, means that it, it's, the timing is perfect. And on that, do you think there's a sort of, like we've seen so many incarnations of this, right, with so many different customers, both across commercial and government, is there sort of a step-by-step -step to get there in terms of understanding what it takes to start thinking about those problems differently and building sort of with that Palantir mindset? Or do you sort of just have to break through that? Well, no secret, if, if, you, if you listen to anything I've said, I, I don't really believe in the, you know, there is no process. There, there is only the content. And so you got to work backwards from the problems, get to roll up your sleeves. I think that's the other thing that's really catalyzing this moment is the AI revolution, right? You, you cannot think your way through this. You have to actually, it's an experiential journey. And the people who are rolling up their sleeves and playing with this stuff and experimenting and, and on that journey from prototype to production are learning the fastest and they're getting the best results by doing that. The people who are kind of ringing their hands, paying for another study, thinking about which use cases are worth going after, like they're just getting left in the dust. Uh, and you, you know, if you zoom out very far, I know we have some European colleagues here today, no, no offense, but I, I, Europe is wringing their hands pretty hard. Uh, and you can see the relative performance difference in, in, you know, the economy of Europe and the economy of the US right now. So you mentioned AI there. We've seen the landscape of the model side of AI, these large language models. It's really starting to even out, right? The progress is becoming more incremental. There's a sort of hot or not list for sure in terms of those vendors, but it's definitely incremental progress at this stage. Whereas I feel like, certainly from my experience, the deployment of said models, there are still leaps and bounds to come. Like we're seeing genuinely transformative approaches to like how you leverage these models in the field. So with that in mind, you mentioned AI. How is Palantir thinking about that? What is our sort of approach to AI at this stage? 
Yeah, I mean, to, to borrow uh, Stephen Cohen, one of the co-founders of Palantir's framework for thinking about this, is you can, you can kind of say that broadly speaking, there's AI supply and AI demand. And on the supply side with the models, we see that they are getting better but we also see they're getting more similar. If you look at the closed and open source models, they're converging upon each other, and the rate of improvement is leveling off. So I think you know, there's a necessary amount of investment on the demand side. I might argue you know, maybe there's structural, maybe there's overinvestment, people could say there's not, maybe, you know, but there, there's a lot of investment there. There's a dearth of investment on the demand side of this. Like, How are you actually gonna use these models to achieve economic value? And I think we're at the very early innings of the necessary tool chain that you actually need. I think it's it is a revolution that's as it's analogous to digital computing. You know, we we get to really pretend that there are zeros and ones flowing through the CPU. That's not what's happening. There's an analog waveform that's going through that, and we've created such a leak-proof abstraction, error correction, the whole tool chain around this, both in hardware and software, that we actually get to pretend that there are zero ones flowing through that. And that abstraction allows us to build very complicated and sophisticated software. And I think we're in this in, in, indeterminate period between analog and digital in the LLM equivalent where you know we're wrestling with how do we get them to be as reliable as we would need them to be. Now we have this stochastic thing that we've inserted into a, a tool chain that has historically been completely deterministic and we get unexpected results. You know, and, and that's the engineering problem that's in front of us that we're very excited about going after. And I think we've, we've, you know, in my, my view, we're ahead on actually excreting the tool chain that developers are going to need to get from prototype to production. Nobody wants to be on the self-driving car journey. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2005, we had the DARPA Grand Challenge. It drove 120 miles through the desert. It wasn't a shitty prototype. That's, that's a real demonstration of the technology. Why did it take 20 years to get to the point where you can drive through a city, right? And um, that... That, that, I think, is what we need to, as collectively, as a community, really focus on getting to production as quickly as possible. So speaking of use cases and getting to production, as you mentioned there, we announced AIP in April of last year, right? We're coming up on a full year, the first full year of AIP. How has our sort of intuition or our approach to those use cases changed, right? Like the tool chain is there, but surely that intuition of what does, I mean, there's no perfect AI use case, right? But how we go about sort of scoping that with customers and perhaps how our customers are starting to think about that. We started in chat, we're definitely going beyond that now, yeah. but how do you see that kind of evolving over the coming months and years? The, the, the last few months have given me an extreme amount of conviction that the value is in automation, mm -hmm. is in, in enterprise autonomy, essentially. You know, maybe you can be 50% more productive with a co-pilot. You know, I think chat is kind of structurally a dead end. It's not, it's, it's, it's highly charismatic, but you can do actually not that much with it, uh, but all of the economic value is, is going to be in thinking about AI as a type of labor. So decomp the problem into, you know, what can a human do? What does a subject matter expert do as distinct from a human, which is, is which is a much higher bar that, you, you know, you wouldn't expect the models to inherently be able to do today. What is actually workflow? The workflow still matters here. What is traditional software in ML? And, and you know, um, how do you string these things together to actually accomplish the workflow? So when you start doing that, you realize like there's a lot of value in, in, in kind of almost like promoting your existing users over workflow to being managers of AI agents and decomping the problem in a way that you can have an agent operate reliably. So you start all of the day two problems end up being the important ones. So what, what is the telemetry that I'm getting off of the agents as they're working? How do I understand whether they're behaving the ways that I want or not? How do I continue to decomp and refine the problem? Because when you think about autom if all the value is in automation, what have we been doing for the last 20 years with self-driving cars? We've been handling edge cases. You know, automation is is limited by edge cases. That's that's really what it is. The happy path is pretty easy. That's what we had in 2005. Uh, and so the tool chain that enables you to capture, learn, feedback the edge cases to get there as quickly as possible is is the winning tool chain. And I, I think that's what how we really need to think about how, how we decomp these problems and get after it to incorporate the user feedback that we're all building software for as we promote them to being managers of AI agents. And thinking about that in the context of DevCon, like people in this room are gonna be building over the next couple of days. I think historically, having been at Palantir over six years, like some of the strongest use cases and workflows I've seen have actually been built by customers. They're built by the experts. And when they feel empowered by the tooling, it's incredible what they come up with. Curious kind of the examples you've seen now in the AI wave of like how our customers, you mentioned shifting roles, how they've moved from sort of the user to the, the agent governor, the agent architect. Like, are there any examples of how that sort of evolved over the past few months? And I guess also, I'm curious to get your take. You have a unique perspective across both commercial and government, right? So 
are you seeing sort of leaders laggers like has anything been surprising over the past few months in terms of who's leading the charge there the use cases i'm most excited about are the ones where we already understand the humans aren't perfect mm -hmm. and then time is your enemy so if you have infinite time to do this you kind of get caught in these like academic loops of like well you know what's the equal you know how do we measure these things is it good enough how do we you know and, and you never really kind of get there when you recognize look this decision is being made one way or another because that's an operational reality how do i just make it better uh, and I already recognize that given the time constraints and everything that's happening, the humans are very constrained. Like that's that's a great use case. So on the government side, one of the ones I'm, I'm most proud of, of applying LLMs to is machine assisted disclosure of, of intelligence sharing. So if you look at real world events that are happening, how does the US share intelligence with foreign partners? Usually you, ha you have a document that codifies the rules and the policies of what can be shared under what conditions. Human is reading that, human is looking at the raw intelligence. That process would take three days. Well, guess what? In three days, the missile's already landed. So the question is really like, how do you use the LLM to quickly look at the security classification guide, automatically rewrite the intelligence, cite the guide, tell the human where to look at. So the human's doing the final QC, but something that took three days now takes three minutes. Mm -hmm. You know that, and, and you already know your humans were imperfect at doing this, even when they did take three days. So it's one of these very high pressure use cases that I think um, it engenders this sort of necessary pragmatism that drives adoption and the reps that you mm -hmm. need to get after it. The other part of this that I think is, is kind of crazy is like we, we all focus on, you know, co-pilots make the most sense if you think the greatest value add is going to be improving the performance of the median individual in the institution. There is no doubt that that's gonna happen. But I'm not, I don't think that's the greatest value add. I think you know, th there are these power law outcomes that are gonna happen here with this. This technology means like the very best humans in, this, in the institution are going to be way more important than they ever were before. They're gonna be levered up by the technology. So as you, as you like go after these use cases, the part of the opportunity is as you're creating these AI agents, it's like they become huge levers for the people who are the, 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 the core drivers of productivity for these workflows and an, an ability to institutionalize how it is that they even drive what they're doing across the rest of the institution. And speaking of the strongest individuals at these institutions, we have a whole room full of them, I believe, in my personal opinion, at least. So people are going to leave DevCon, they're going to go back to their various organizations, back to work, as it were. How do you, I think there's a certain amount of chaos that comes with the creativity that's required to deliver on this, right? And while it sort of starts here in this room, it starts with the individual, we're going to see a sort of re-architecting of these entire organizations, right? There is no process here. It requires a certain amount of chaos to get to what actually matters, which is the content, the outcome, yeah. right? So how do you sort of envisage that process to, or those organizations changing as well in terms of like, is it going to be okay, we now need the protocol for how to deploy AI? Or actually, do we think we need to be ready for more chaos and more fluctuation, as it were? I think we should be, you know, we should be, we should brace a period of a lot of creative chaos right now. Um, I, I think we could say that the organ, at best, the organizational boundaries that we've had over the last two decades were right for a pre-AI era. Why, why would it follow naturally that you, you that would is be exactly how you ought to be organized in the future? So I think the organizations that are going to do well are the ones who are willing to reimagine, well, how should we be organized? And I think what you see, this is the idea with forward deploy engineering, is pushing that technical expertise into operations is going to be really important. You know, and, and the operational expertise, like why does it matter? The, if we go back to the Hurricane Helene example, you have... 700 uniform service members who are not, who would not have considered themselves programmers or developers in a formal sense, but the malleability of their software as, as, as the kind of, it's their Iron Man suit, right? Their ability to tailor it and retailer it to meet the moment and, and the challenges they have. I think that's going to be a, a crucial capability. So I, I think it's actually going to be very empowering to developers. I, you know, I don't really view the, the use case of asking it to generate some like boilerplate TypeScript as the interesting impact that it's going to have. It's actually going to liberate developers to move into the business much more and be much more levered in the impact they deliver. Yeah, I think the winners are ultimately going to be the organizations and the individuals that can embrace that chaos, right? And focus on what matters, focus on the outcomes. I'm actually curious, looking kind of a little bit inwards, obviously the, our culture here at Palantir and the culture that everyone in this room, like building in one of our offices is going to experience, right? We've seen that develop over the past few years as well. How are you thinking about our culture changing a little bit in terms of the forward deployed engineer, the role that engineer takes in the advent of AI and as our organizations become, or customers become the developers, become the builders as well? Culturally, what do you think that means for Palantir? A little bit of the sort of inside story. Well, there's two parts to it. One is what I've been telling all of our, our forward deployed engineers is like, you have to understand the developers are now your customer. The way that you would embed with someone in Detroit or Djibouti to help them accomplish their mission, actually now the developer 
is who you need to be embedding with and understanding how quickly can you turn around features that it, that improve the platform. And so I think part of what I really like and it would encourage you all as, as attendees of DevCon is like to be, you know, I want the people who are perpetually dissatisfied, the people who are always going to complain about what more the developer platform could be doing for them because that is the signal. You know, I tell the four deploy engineers, your job is to metabolize pain and excrete product, right? So I, I, we need your pain and we will be responsive to it. Uh, but I think the other part that is internally, I mean, the opportunity, but just human factors is legitimately hard is the AI revolution requires us to reinvent a huge amount of tradecraft. And so if, if you're the sort of person, you're like, well, wow, I've been really successful. I've done this for a decade. I just want to keep doing what it is that we were doing before. Like, that's not going to keep working. Right, like actually, there's a wholesale reinvention and recreation of tradecraft that you got to have to you have to go earn from first principles how to apply this. And I think you know the closer you are to the old world, the more you're like, how do I just sprinkle this into my existing workflows? And you know, I think you might get some marginal improvements from that. But there there is an opportunity to really reimagine this and be maximalist around it. And um, I think that's that's created opportunities internally for people who have been here three months to actually be in charge of big things that you know people who've been here three years are are lagging behind on. And we're rolling into 2025 in just a couple of months. Um, you mentioned automation. You mentioned kind of the iteration on the strategy that we've seen over the past few months. What are you most excited for next year? From Sham's personal point of view, what do you think is coming next that you're most excited about? Uh, it, it is around automation. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of calling it project autopilot internally, but <laughs> how do we, so it, it, it's, it's actually kind of mirroring some of the tradecraft we built on the government side with what we call target workbench. It's essentially the automation of the targeting process, but a lot of the lessons we learned there about how you interact, how humans interact with that automation uh, under high stakes consequences and, and scenarios, really bringing that as a tool chain that enables developers to build the automations, govern the edge cases, create the feedback loops, that, that um, help you all instantiate armies of AI agents. Awesome, and yeah, with the last few minutes that we have here, so you mentioned there's gonna be pain, right? I hope for the builders at DevCon, it's the right kind of pain. Like if it's organizational pain, please let me know. Um, <laughs> but if it's product pain, that's great, we want that. Um, with those last few minutes, what would you impart onto our, our audience of builders and technical leadership here at DevCon? We've got two days of the event coming up, our longest event yet, right? What should people bear in mind as they approach these sessions? Well, you know, we want to focus on the things that make you more different, more special, the things that create alpha in your institutions. You know, I certainly remember a pre-AWS world where, frankly, when AWS was coming out, it was a little emasculating that I wouldn't get to set up my own Linux box and I wouldn't be able to pet it in the corner. And that was part of, like, you know, I don't know, my, my sense of self. Uh, and I can't even imagine doing that now. And my children will never even know that there, that there is a physical box out there, right? And so you think about how much we've absorbed this. I think there's, there's an opportunity like that for us here where we're, we're essentially, if AWS deprecated infrastructure, I think our, our tool chain can deprecate backend development. And uh, a lot of that stuff is actually really hard and really non-differentiated. Like, you, you don't derive competitive advantage from that. You just need it to work. What, where you derive real advantage from is the applications that run your business, the things that actually make sense. So creating this declarative approach to backend, just like there's a declarative approach to infrastructure that allows you to go build the things at the speed, you know, compete on speed, really. Uh, and so I think thinking about that as a frame of like, where could we give you more leverage? Where can we take the stuff off that's like hard, but actually all beta and all undifferentiated so that you can go faster and focus on the things that make you special and more different as institutions? Like uh, that, that's where I think the opportunity is. And I think with that, we're going to be rolling into a set of customer keynotes now. My personal take is you're going to see what I think is one of the most exciting mixes of like product and culture, right? We're seeing companies re-architect their deployment, their technical solutions, but also re-architect their own operations, their own businesses, how they look inward as well. So something to bear in mind, some of those cues of like how a company is thinking about this, not just from a technical lens, but also a strategic lens. And with that, Sharm, any final words to impart to this crew? Uh no, enjoy the day. Uh, you know, eager for your feedback on all this stuff. Um, please let your ambition run unbridled. <laughs>